Hi everyone. Um, we're doing cervical cancer today, and I hope that by the end of the presentation, we'll be able to have a few thoughts and um, misconceptions cleared, and then we'll have a fair idea what cervical cancer is. We may not go too much into details because there are some details we do not need but we'll try as much as possible to cover what is important so let's look at a few definitions <clears throat> the cervix this is the narrow like passage forming the lower end of the womb it opens to allow passage between the uterus and the vagina Cancer or malignancy involves abnormal cell growth with the potential to invade or spread to other parts of the body. We can therefore say that cervical cancer occurs when abnormal cells on the cervix or on the neck of the uterus grows out of control. Now, what causes cervical cancer? Cervical cancer usually begins with genetic mutations. So then there are abnormal cells and these cells begin to multiply. Now after they have multiplied, they form a mass which we call tumor. Now this tumor also grows and it has the tendency of breaking off from the original place it started, the initial place it started. Now, once it breaks away, it has the tendency of invading, like we read earlier, invading other parts of the body. And this is what we call metastasis. Research has also shown that the HPV, which is a human papilloma virus, plays a role in the cervical cancer. Now, the virus spreads through sexual contact. And so in other words, it's a sexually transmitted virus. However, there are people with the HPV, there are women which ate with HPV who do not have cervical cancer. And so there are strains of, um, of the HPV which causes cervical cancer. There are some that causes genital warts and so on. And so we cannot say that the human papilloma virus alone causes cancer of the cervix. Which also implies that there are other factors that would help the HPV cause cancer. Now we take a look at the risk factors. Multiple sexual partners is key. Bear in mind that having multiple sexual partners does not only mean you sleeping with more than one partner, but it also means that you are sleeping with the partners of your partner or of your partners. So if even if you have just one partner, if he's sleeping with two, three, four, five or more different women, it means that you are, in other words, sleeping with those other women, especially if he does that without the use of condoms. So whichever viruses he picks from them, he brings to you. Another risk factor is early sexual activity. So when you have a teenager start sex, it increases her risk of the HPV. Now once you have other sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis and all that, it increases your risk of getting the HPV. A weak immune system is a good start on the route of getting the, the, the disease. Reason being that 
most women or let me say every woman at a point in her life has been exposed to the HPV however once your immune system is strong or once you have good immunity it fights off the virus and then the tendency for it to develop and become a full-blown condition is low but in a, in a weak immune system the virus is able to remain and multiply and then cause the gene mutation which will further cause your tumor and if you are unfortunate the metastasis occurs now amongst women who smoke or are obese there is the tendency of being prone to the disease once you have the HPV exposure now you may ask how you would know or what you would feel if you have cancer of the cervix let me remind you and state clearly that at the initial stages of cervical cancer you may not feel anything you may not experience anything you may not see any signs at all until it gets to the advanced stage or until it starts advancing that you may experience vaginal bleeding after sex or vaginal bleeding between your periods and that is to say if you have a 28 day cycle for instance there is the tendency of you bleeding say on the 12th to 15th day of your cycle when you're actually expecting it on the 28th day so that is bleeding between your periods and then you could also bleed after menopause when you know you are done with your menses you're not bleeding and then you realize that you've started spotting spotting is when you see just some few drops of blood in your panty or in your liner so it may range from spotting to heavy bleeding now you could also see watery bloody or even thick vaginal discharge that may be heavy and have a foul odor now usually when we say heavy we don't mean that the discharge is thick or it has weight but we refer to the amount of it like a heavy menstrual flow refers to the amount of blood loss so yes we refer to the amount of discharge it won't be something mild that you would see as a normal discharge this would be quite an amount now you could experience pelvic pain when it is not your period when it is not your menses you could also experience the same pain during sex now when you experience or you see these signs you need to be smart enough and quickly consult your doctor the diagnosis we are breaking it into three parts first the screening screening is done not when you're experiencing signs and symptoms no screening is done when you feel well now it is at this point that early early signs of cancers can be determined so for cervical cancer we have pap test the pap smear test and the hpv dna test now with the pap smear the doctor or the nurse will will just scrape off some cells from your cervix and these cells will be tested on to see if they are precancerous or anything that could lead to cervical cancer and with the hpv dna test the virus is isolated to see if they are cancer causing virus so at this stage if anything is detected treatment is is um is possible treatment is safe and then the prognosis the outcome of treatment is most often very good the second we would look at is diagnosis now under diagnosis we could have punch biopsy endocervical curettage electrical wire loop 
or cone biopsy. Now, all these tests, <coughs> sorry, all these tests aim at diagnosing whether you have the cancer or not. Now, what they do is that in all these tests, some tissue from your cervix will be taken and then tests will be run on it to determine if it is really a cervical cancer you have. And mind you, this is done when the doctor suspects that you might have some form of cervical cancer. The third is staging. Now, after the diagnosis has been done, after the diagnosis has been done and um, the doctor suspects that yes, you have some form of cervical cancer, he would not want to know the extent to which it has gone the extent to which the cells have grown so we do imaging tests and imaging tests refer to tests that bring some form of um, photographic or an image that you can read from so we have the CT scan we have the um, the x-rays we have the MRIs all these tests bring pictures or videos for you to see and actually confirm that the patient has this and this is the extent which is gone to. Now we could have visual examination of the bladder and rectum. Either a cystoscopy, any, any test that could be done for the doctor to see the bladder or the rectum. Now mind you, earlier on we stated that in metastasis, it could the cancer could spread to organs that are nearby. Now the cervix is located in between the bladder in front and the rectum behind. So if it starts to spread, it is most likely to affect the bladder and the front part or the rectum at the back. So the doctor would want to check to see if the bladder and rectum are safe that is under the staging part of diagnosis now there are four stages like i said there are four stages of cancer and it's it runs through all cancers now let's look at cervical cancer stages stage one the cancer is just confined to the cervix so you don't have any abnormal cells anywhere else apart from the cervix. In stage 2, the cancer is still in the cervix, but the upper portion of the vagina would have been affected. However, in stage 3, the cancer would have moved to the lower portion of the vagina or even internally to the pelvic side wall. In stage 4, Cancer would have spread to nearby organs such as the bladder or the rectum. Or it could even spread <clears throat> to other areas of the body like the lungs, the liver or the bones. The same mechanism of spread through the bloodstream. It could be deposited any part of the body. So somebody could have cervical cancer. The next moment you hear she has developed bone cancer or lung cancer. Or any other form of cancer somewhere else now usually with the stage 1 treatment is relatively simpler and effective as the stages go up the gravity goes up too treatment there are three major forms of treatment there's surgery, there's chemotherapy, and there's radiation. The three could be combined and they could also be treated, they could also be used separately depending on the stage of the cancer. Now with the surgery, there's simple hysterectomy and radical hysterectomy. Hysterectomy simply means removal of the uterus 
either part of it or the whole. Now in simple hysterectomy, the cervix and the uterus are removed along with the cancer. It is usually an option in stage 1. So you know that once you take it off, the tendency or the probability of it spreading has been taken off. However, in radical hysterectomy, the cervix, the uterus, part of the vagina, the lymph nodes in the area are all cleared alongside the cancer. So this is likely to be stage 2. Sometimes, possibly stage 3. So what happens is, in this case, the cervix goes, the person's womb goes, a larger portion of the vagina goes, and um, some lymph nodes, or yes, the lymph nodes in that particular area. Now I'm sure the moment you hear the vagina goes, I'm sure some people are like, hey, so no, what we call the vagina is, <coughs> sorry, it's not what you call the vagina. Remember that the vagina is the canal, so the walls of the vagina will be taken off. What you see is the entrance of the vagina, is the opening that will remain. But within the walls that has the walls that have the rage, the walls that are folded, the ones that can actually hold or as it were trap the penis would be gone. So with the radiation, it could be done externally or internally or sometimes both. Now with external radiation, the beam is directed just like x-rays are done from outside. And then it's, it's, directed, to the, it's directed at the cervix. So it goes through the skin and then it does whatever work it has to do by killing the cancerous cells. Internally, a device is placed into the vagina and then it works equally. But that's usually for shorter periods than the external. In some cases, they may combine both the external and the internal. <coughs> then we take a look at chemotherapy. With chemotherapy, drugs are usually injected through the vein to kill the cancer cells. Now you could combine the low doses of chemo with radiotherapy. In advanced cervical cancer, high doses of chemotherapy is used. Now, coping and support. Really, one, one, one thing that kills patients faster is their inability to cope and the fact that there's no support from anywhere. In our side of the world, it is even more difficult because there are points or there are times you really don't have who to talk to, you don't know who to share your problems with for fear of being discriminated against. And that is one major killer. Now, to be able to cope well, you need to understand certain things. That people treat you the way they treat you because they do not have enough knowledge on what is wrong with you. The best thing you can do for yourself is to learn about the condition. Get to understand what it is. Understand what goes into it. And then make decisions about your care. Your caregiver is not supposed to impose anything on you. So, once you know what your condition is, you can make decisions together. Once you're able to make decisions on your own care, it means that to a very large extent, you get to control what people do or feel or think about you. That will help you boost your own confidence. Another thing you need to do is to find somebody to talk to. Yes, it may be difficult to talk to a family member or a friend for fear of the discrimination that is one, for fear of gossip. But if you do not have any friend 
or any family member to talk to you can talk to your your caregiver who would understand you you can also join cancer associations there are quite a number of them and these are support groups that help you also need to let people know that this is what you have and allow them when they want to help battling cancer is stressful not just physically but it is emotionally psychologically and financially stressful when you allow people in and you make them know that this is what I have it helps them treat you differently it releases the stress on you some family members can help financially some church members and various groups of people you mingle with can help in their own way it may not always be financial but the spiritual support the emotional support the psychological support goes way 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 to help in, in times like this now you need to set reasonable goals mind you you are ill whether you accept it or not you're not as fit as you used to be so you set reasonable goals whatever goals you set should be smart you should know that I should be able to achieve this within this period of days or this period of, of hours or months make them realistic do not set outrageous goals do not set goals that you know you cannot achieve goals that you're going to stress yourself to achieve so that at the end of the day you don't end up blaming yourself that eh, I've been cursed I have this disease I can't do anything no there's so much you can do it is just that you're not setting reasonable goals even if it is possible discuss your goals with people and tell them I want to do this do you think I could finish it within this period of time if you're able to achieve your goals you feel better now one very important thing you need to do is to take time for yourself having cancer is not the end of the world hello make time for yourself chill relax eat well eat good by eating well by eating good please i do not mean your frankie's ice cream your paye your kfc's and the rest eat well your vegetables your fruits drink a lot of water your organics if it's possible speak to a dietitian let him or help or her um, help or assist you in planning your meals rest when you need to rest sleep when you need to sleep don't stress yourself do not overwork yourself do not feel depressed do not do anything do not go near people who would depress you always hang around with people who would make you laugh people who would get you excited life is just about living and living it and living good that's just it having said all these now we know the major causes of cervical cancer so in prevention I would say practice safe sex now in practicing safe sex it's not just about using the condom remember having fewer sexual partners and delaying intercourse may reduce the risk of cervical cancer it would not prevent you totally from getting it but then it reduces your chances greatly speak with your partners explain the disease condition to them encourage them to use condoms even when sleeping with other partners because remember if your partner has five other partners or even two other partners and those other partners have various other partners and those other various partners have various various other partners remember you're sleeping 
with your partner, his partners, their partners. Now, you should have routine pap smear tests. Some schools of thought believe that after age 21, you should have the test every few years. So you can start with a test every three years, every three years, then you gradually reduce it to every two years as you age. Then at age 40 to 50, you can do it annually. It is at this stage that any precancerous cells would be detected and dealt with. Any detection during pap smear is easier to deal with than diagnosis during biopsies and, and, and all, all those you know tissue tests. Now you could also get vaccinated against HPV. However, for Ghana, I can't say much because I haven't seen the vaccine yet, if there is. So, what I will say is, follow the other preventions. Please, if per chance you get exposed to the vaccine, grab it. But it works better if you take it before you become sexually active. Because what is the point? You have the virus already. And you're taking the vaccine that's like pouring water on stone but if you take the vaccine before you start sex for most of us listening it won't apply but you could carry the message on to your siblings now women who smoke and are obese are also at a great risk of getting the cervical cancer so please and a big please do not smoke either as a primary smoker or a secondary smoker. Do not smoke because mind you, the secondary smoker smokes or inhales more than the primary smoker. Thank you all so much for the time and um, there's room for questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I... I wait for your questions. <laughs>